Hello and welcome to the Gear of the Week show here on the Golf Month YouTube channel and welcome to a second-hand equipment special. Um, we've seen a few comments over the last few weeks uh, from you guys asking us to chat about second-hand equipment, how to get it and what clubs to look out for. Uh, so we thought we'd dedicate a whole episode to that today. Um, so I hope you're looking forward to that. We will have some new gear to start the show off though. Uh, it would be remiss of us not to chat about some of the most exciting irons coming out for 2023. Um, so we'll, we'll chat about that very shortly. But for now, say hello uh, to Joel Tadman, Neil Tappen. How are you, how are you both doing? Very good, Daniel. How are you? Good. Daniel, yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. Neil, looking well? Uh, looking well. Feeling a little uh, under the weather, actually. Just picking oh. up a, a, a mild bit of pre-Christmas lurgy. That time uh, of year, isn't it? That time of but, year now. Not not long till Christmas. No, no. I know. But um, yeah, fine. Uh, do you have a quiz question for us, though? That's the most important thing uh, for us to start with. Good. I do. Do you know, this is, um, this is going to be a, this is a two-party. You get half a point for both parts and oh, so you get the, so opportunity, bad at this to get, you get the opportunity to get two questions wrong <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly that's what i'm worried about <laughs> okay so part one what was the first ping g product and that's now I, I, I will i will um i will preface this by also adding that there's half a chance there may have been a product way back when yeah, Ping G product that I've missed somewhere along the line. If I have, please someone correct me about yeah. it. I apologize. There's, but the there's... first one in the kind of run of Ping G products of the modern era. I can um, check that for you, Neil, because I have a Ping uh, encyclopedia. It's about this thick uh, in the next room. So I won't look at wow. it for the question, but I can check <laughs> check for you afterwards. You really are the gear expert, Joel, sat on your yeah. Ping encyclopedia. Um there's definitely some golf club historians who watch the Gear of the Week show, so I'm sure they'll be able to correct you, Neil. But I'm going to say it's the G5. That's Dan's my got G5. Uh, that's my first offer. So I'm, I'm pretty sure there was one called the Ping G, but that came after a that few. That came after like 10 yeah. and 15 and so like, 20, logic would suggest the G was the first, and then they started adding numbers. But I wonder, if is there was there a G2 or a G2? Ping G2. Oh, there, no, might be, uh, there might have been a G2, actually. No, I'm going to go G5. Yesterday. I'm going to go G5. I don't think there was a G2. Right. Answers are in. The uh, They've been verified, and you're both incorrect. <laughs> no, it was yeah. Ping G2. Oh, Joel, go your gut, mate. G2, go your gut. And it was the first product that I... I'm, I'm giving a slight clue to part two of the next question. It's the first product that I was I went to, I, I reviewed, I think, for golf golf monthly oh, so wow. the second part of the question is what year was the ping g2 driver launched i'm still devastated by not yeah, you're, yeah i would there. be if i were um, you as well to, joe you need to read that encyclopedia yeah you should closer. have it out more often um well when did you start a golf monthly then a while ago oh gosh ages. I, i'm gonna say 2002 it's not not a lot far away from where I was thinking. Uh, Straight 20 years. I mean, oh, that makes sense with the two as well. Mm. Uh, Beat me God, to do a good I'm going to join you on that, Dan. I'm going to join you. You followed me down the wrong path last time, Joel. Are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> oh, for, okay, for the sake of it, I'll go 2001. <laughs> okay. I thought that you were going to make the fatal error there, Joel, of copying Dan, which would have been a bad mistake because, Dan, you are wrong. Um, but you didn't follow Dan. But you still got the answer wrong, Joel. Yeah. I'm afraid it was 2003. Oh, August 2003. Went the wrong way. Off the went post. The wrong way. One year out. Yeah. <laughs> One year out, as Ken Bruce would oh, say. Did, yeah, I knew it was close. I didn't know if to get up or down. Again, made the wrong decision. Can I have a one year out t shirt, please, Neil? And can I get a signed photo? <laughs> <laughs> Bad day. Dan, you, 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 I think you could spend a little bit of time over the Christmas period, maybe doing some <laughs> reading. I, up I about think while, while the Gear of the Week show takes our Christmas break, <laughs> I might do a bit of uh, uh, revising because I've had a mare over the last few episodes. Um, we'll come back stronger. I might start having to ask the questions to avoid more. Yeah, I have to say, this does make me look like I know everything about golf equipment. That's not necessarily the case. Maybe we should mix up who asked the questions just to give people a week. <laughs> no. Um, no. good stuff though let us know down in the, in the comments if you if you got that or if there's an earlier ping g which the like you said Neil, there might be in the the yeah. i'm sure you can in which out case, I, I immediately go to sort of minus 10 points yeah agreed agreed below me um okay brilliant and that's sort of on the theme actually of, of older equipment secondhand equipment which we're going to chat about later in the episode we're going to chat about some of our favorite clubs you know of, of ours that we've had that we've loved and and franchises that we still think have got some great value today for you guys to go and pick up as well as some tips on how to buy secondhand and, and some pitfalls to avoid and some tips and tricks. But 
it would be remiss of us, Joel, not to chat about some exciting new gear that has come out on the Gear of the Week show. Um, and it is a new uh, series of irons from Taylor Made. The P7 series is back for 2023. You've got them in your hand. You've hit them. You've tested them. Let us all know how they are. They look amazing. Yeah, so these are irons for the better player. Um, yes. The three three new models, the 770, the 7MC and the 7 and the 7MB. Mm-hmm. This is the 770. So this is the iron I or currently play or the old model I currently play. And these changes that they've made in both in all three of these irons, they're a bit more visual really, kind of just stepping up the aesthetics a little bit rather than the performance. You're not going to see big jumps in in distance or anything like that in terms of um performance, but I just made some subtle refinements to these clubs. So uh, that's the P770. Uh, the P7MC, I think, in particular, looks absolutely fantastic. You can see there, a beautiful looking iron. Oh, yeah. It's very, um, they've, they've, it feels like they put a, more, a few more angles on the back of it. Do you know what I mean? Some more harsher lines. I don't uh, know how to describe it. It's the pretty similar. Kind of this 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 rib section has just yeah. been, been toned down a bit, but it's, it's a beautiful looking club from every angle. It's got a milled mm. face. Fully forged, so you know this is the club. If you're a really low handicapper, a good ball striker, something that you're going to gravitate towards. Not overly forgiving. If you want a bit more forgiveness in your in your low handicap irons, the 770 is the way to go. And they're very very much inspired by tour players. So feedback from Tiger Woods on the P770 wanted more compact long irons, so he's got that in the in the new P770. And then Colin Morikawa has been influential in in the MC and the MB in particular, the blade. It's got a slightly different sole to it. So narrower sole, a bit more bounce on the leading edge just to give you better turf interaction. So you're not, as again, these aren't technology packed irons, certainly in the case of the MC and the MB, all about feel, shot making, workability, that sort of thing. But if you if you like that soft, buttery feel and like to be creative with your iron shots, I think you're going to really enjoy what these P-series irons have to offer. What, what I quite like, Joel, is that they still have that sort of tailor-made footprint or signature to them, even though they're very classic. Yeah, so this for this to MC has got this nice, nice little T bug logo yeah. here in the mm. corner. Very classic um, looking, but it, you can tell it's a tailor made iron. Even if you took all the branding yeah. off it, it's got that kind of like high tech look to it, even though, as you said, it's, it's a bit technology wise, it's much more stripped back than you'll find elsewhere with their other irons because there's very little you can, I would su- suggest, there's not as much you can do with that sort of iron. But it's still yeah. got that thing that people love about tailor made book golf products, I would say. Yeah, I agree. And especially in the case of the P770, you've got that speed, the speed pocket on the sole, which we've seen in multiple generations, just to make it feel a bit more lively off the face. Um, it's got it's got that speed foam air inside as well, which we saw in the P790. So it should feel a little bit softer. And I've tested it out on the course. It does feel a little bit softer. Um, but in terms of kind of distance, it's basically exactly the same as the old version, but it just looks a bit better. A little bit more slimmed down as well, which I think some people with the P770, especially in the long irons, felt there was a little bit too much offset it was a little bit chunky i didn't necessarily agree with that but they've just slimmed it down a little bit to appeal to the eye of the better player nice one and did you see morikawa's got the p got the p7 cm in his bag for for colin morikawa i think that's just i'm guessing the mc with his uh his bit of sparkle dust yeah on it or something, i know you know it looked, it looked like a bit of a raw finish on it it looked mm. slightly different kind of wasn't a plated finish on it so maybe that's something that colin likes the look of he prefers that duller finish from a, something a bit rawer so yeah i think that's kind of his own twist on the mc yeah it? and it's interesting that you said that they've gone back to the tour players for some advice some, some ways to um you know refine this club because it was already a very good club uh, a couple of years ago and and ping did that with the i230 as well they went back to their tour players i think during the the lockdown and said listen guys what 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 can we do to this iron the, the i210 at the time and again a very good iron uh, where does the p770 who's that going to be competing against going into 2023 of, of the irons that we that we know about already yeah so i230 is 100% um, one of the irons that's going to compete against maybe t100s so mm-hmm. a slightly stronger lofted better play iron so this is the p770 is 33 degrees p uh, t100s is 32 um so yeah that sort of iron basically kind of yeah. um traditionally lofted compact but has a little bit more liveliness off the face than a blade uh and last one for me on this then do you think this new 770 could encourage p7 current p790 users down into the p770 at a slightly uh smaller more compact club do you think it's got that enough forgiveness for people who are in that mid to low handicap range to go one club i don't say one club better but you know one club more compact one club you know better playery 
Yeah, possibly, Dan. And P770 is a little bit smaller. But, um, what I would say is that it is a quite a significant difference in the lofts between the P790 and the P770. So if you're used to hitting your P790s a certain distance and you switch into the P770, you will see a pretty significant drop off in distance. But if that's something that you don't mind experiencing and you're able to gap the different gaps at both ends of the bag with another club or a hybrid or a wedge, whatever it might be, um, I think it's definitely an option if you're looking for something a bit smaller because the p790 is i wouldn't say a chunky iron but it's a, a has a bigger footprint than the p770 so if you are an improving golfer your handicaps come down you want something that looks a bit sleeker the p770 i would say is a, is a decent upgrade but if you're a current p770 user don't think you're going to see yeah. massive gains by switching into the new model a lot of it is visual yeah yeah i think that happens i think when you when you've bought clubs that get replaced by another generation you aren't going to see that jump there it, it's going to be further down the line anyway um but very interesting and your full reviews are on the golf monthly website yes they are indeed dive deep into joel's reviews there um i think uh a contender for 2023 for sure for some very exciting irons good work joel thank you very much um that about do for new gear this week though so we're gonna uh focus in now on secondhand golf clubs because we've seen uh a lot of people in our in the comment section of the gear of the week show talking about you know how, what secondhand clubs to go for how do i go about buying secondhand clubs uh so we thought we'd sort of focus on that today and we want to start um i think going down a bit of a nostalgic path chaps of of, of clubs that we've used in the past that we loved as well as talking about some franchise releases over the last three or four or five years even longer potentially um but if you're on the secondhand market right now for a driver fairway irons whatever it might be these are the sort of um franchises models to, to look out for um I don't know who wants to start. I, I quite like to start with both of us, Joel, because we've both put down the same one on our notes here. Um, and from the driver perspective, I think if you're looking on the secondhand market now, a place you can't go wrong is any Cobra driver from this model up. So from the F9 up to, to, to the modern day, um, F9 for me was when Cobra sort of hit the driver market and you could take them as a serious driver uh, manufacturer because the F9 was fantastic. I'm reading your review from back in, when was this, Joel? 2017, the F9 Speedback came out? Mm, uh, right. oh, sorry, 2019, excuse me. I've gone, gone a bit too far back there. Um, and it's just a fantastic driver, isn't it? And I think it, it still looks great. I think this has aged fantastically compared to other uh, drivers. And at the price it was at, new, £349, it's obviously come down since then. I don't think you can go too far wrong with this on the second-hand market, and I think we're both in agreement here. Yeah, no, I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head in the, in the way that Cobra really stepped up with, the, with that driver versus what they had before. Um, it was adjustable, it was cheap versus the competition, and it was comparable in terms of kind of ball speed and distance versus a lot of the mainstream driver brands, you know, TaylorMade, Callaway. This was right up there with those. Um, and if you went through that fitting process with it, getting fully dialed in with it, um, you're sacrificing nothing and you're getting a really good driver for I think it was you know $200 less than what the, the premium brands were offering at the time so yeah that was an excellent driver and they've just refined it ever since then yeah the Cobra has remained at that level prices have gone up a little bit but they're still cheaper than you know the, the, the top brands and uh, I think Cobra have really kind of cemented their place among those top brands in that driver category can I just add that he herein lies the the advantage that you have if you are thinking about going for a second-hand club when clubs launch sometimes dare i say it, sometimes we get we all get caught up in the excitement of a new product and some new technology and we always try and offer our best review that we can in terms of taking it out and really offering a review of the product that puts it through its paces and highlights strengths and weaknesses but over time I think we all develop people develop an understanding for which products have actually been really popular which ones have delivered for people over time and if you are going down the second hand route then maybe devising a list of the products over the last as, as joel's just and dan has just done there highlighting products over the last five years let's say that you think of still that the people have really gotten well with and then and then use that as your kind of reference point because there's some products that i mean you've both talked about that driver i used to tailor made m6 driver for a year uh a couple of a few years ago and i love that driver and yeah. it's the driver that got me back from you know i was spraying it around all over the shop on, on the golf course off the tee that was the driver that sort of reinserted a bit of accuracy back into my driving game gave me good distance and to be honest with you if i was if I was still, if I still had that in my bag today, I don't think I'd be an awful lot worse. I don't think I'd be five shots around worse than I am now. Yeah. 
Um, and that's it, isn't it? And that's the art to it. And I think I remember when I was I used to fit people, that was a very popular one in 20 oh 19, 20 was M6. I'm I'm struggling with my years to be perfectly honest with you. As you can tell from the quiz questions, I <laughs> so hopelessly get wrong every uh, every week. Um M6 was huge. For me as well, I'm gonna say if you're if you go back to the Ping G four hundred, I think if you still pick that up, that still looks great. Um because of the finish they used on it, they don't age too badly. If you get one that someone's roofed 10 or 15 times, it doesn't look as bad as, for example, when Taylor made went through that phase of having white crowns on the top where you just get sky marks in them and you buy a used club and it looks terrible. That's another thing I think people need to consider as well is, is how well these drivers age aesthetically and don't go and going far back enough so as you're not losing out on the technology gain. Because I think if you went behind G400 in their, in their range, you'd lose out on a bit of tech. But if you go G400 upwards, so G410, 25, you're still getting the right amount of technology there. Would, would you agree with that, picking a sort of an era to go to, you know, a year, 2016 maybe, and go, right, I'm not going to touch a driver before that, but anything in this space will probably suit me, depending on the brand. I mean, that 2019 era was pretty strong because another strong. driver I really liked i think it was around then was the callaway rogue sub-zero yeah um, yeah, yeah you, i remember a, that joel you absolutely loved that driver didn't oh you? such a good drive <laughs> felt amazing like and it was pretty forgiving for for a low spin driver and i was absolutely gutted i basically i think i got it got stolen on a on a video shoot i was on no um gutted. and i was i was devastated because i actually <laughs> love that driver uh so if you can find a callaway rogue sub-zero in your spec i think you'll really enjoy kind of what it does that's a good recommendation. So yeah, 2019 was a really good, like I said, I was working in, in a shop there fitting people and there was a plethora of drivers to choose. I mean, each brand nailed that year. I don't know what was going on in R&D, but something happened. Um, Neil, you went to uh, Golf Club Sakash uh, early this year, I think, I can't remember when exactly, which is a sort of huge, you could describe it as Aladdin's cave of, of secondhand golf equipment. Um, do you want to give people a little sort of insight into your trip there and sort of things you glean from them, you know, clubs wise, how to go about buying secondhand clubs, stuff like that. Yeah, that, so it's a big, um, it's a big, second, as you said, big secondhand retailer that you can buy online from, but they also have their own uh, store. It's just outside Edinburgh. And um, it's great from two perspectives. One, it's just the best kind of like look down memory lane. Like anyone who's ever, who, who has a sort of, Ponchon for golf clubs is going to probably find some of those clubs that they've they've let go in the past that they sort of hark back to. And if you and, and that's the other point about secondhand clubs, there might be something that you want that's a bit older that you know isn't going to be as technologically advanced, but you just know what you're looking for, and it's 100%. that smaller headed fairway wood or something yeah. that you're after, or a particular putter from a particular era. That's where secondhand clubs can really come into their own as well. But um, yeah, it's it's huge. It's loads and loads of options for everything. And I think that's a really important part here. That if you are going down the secondhand route, it obviously helps if you have a very good idea about what your spec is. So if you have been fitted in the past, take a good look at what club, what, what, what spec your club is so that you know roughly what you're looking for. That's going to make a big difference. If you haven't been fitted in the past, then we've got lots of resources on our website to help you figure out whether you should be thinking about stiff or regular shafts, the benefits of graphite shafts, all of those things. Do a bit of research before you take the plunge because it's very easy to look and go, wow, that whatever it is from 2019 is only 120 quid. I'm going to buy that. But if it's totally the wrong spec for you, it could end up doing you sort of more harm than good. So do your research would be my my part. And then just have a good snoop around. Maybe have a look through some of our old reviews, get an idea for what products maybe are aimed at you from the past so that you can narrow down your search. Narrow down the search in terms of the model and then narrow yeah. it down further in terms of the spec. You're going to have to make a compromise somewhere, I suspect. That compromise might well have to be on the condition of the club. And I know that when when I was there and I looked at we put together three bags and three different price points at the lowest price points. Some of the clubs were, I think it's fair to say, a little bit battered. Well loved. <laughs> Should we say well, well loved? loved? That's a much better way to put it. Um, uh, but I, I, I remember in my three sets, in the middle set, there was a Ping G15 fairway wood that was in totally the wrong spec for me. I took out onto the golf course and, and played with this set of clubs, and I, I loved it. I sort of, <laughs> it was, I really it was just a bit of fun, you know, sort of a bit different. Yeah, and it just, it just, I don't know, just got the ball up and away, no problemo. I really liked it. And the, and the other, the other model that I really liked from what I 
had was the Cobra forged tech irons. I think that fits into this idea of getting things that that you know have been popular. With yeah, the oh, they were su- they were super and- popular, super popular, twenty seventeen ish. Yeah. Um, while we're taking this sort of run down nostalgia's nostalgia pathway, then Joel, any any, you know, we've spoken a lot about clubs that are five or six years old. Anything from from years gone by, ten years plus that that you love that you use because. Um, like Neil said, it, it might not often be the one you want to go for, but it's just it's a good bit of fun, isn't it, to, to look back on these things? Yeah, th- there's one particular club that I look back on very fondly, and that's my my yes putter. Uh, <laughs> you know, you can't. I don't think you can buy them anymore. Um, but yeah, I had a yes putter. It was a the Courtney model has the C groove on the face. So it rolled the ball really well, and I, you know, I went through about five different grips on it keeping the same head because I just love the way it felt, the way it looked, the way it rolled the ball. So if you can get your hands on a yes putter. What happened to it? Why is it? I still it, got why, it. I've still, oh, still got, got it. it. Yeah, oh, I've still got it. just framed it somewhere. I think I just needed a change, but I had it in the bag for, for a lot of years. Shot my best ever round with it. Uh, five under par. Um, Clang. Oh, just have to that in there. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, lots of no need for that. For that. No one asked um, for that. <laughs> I guess I must have had a bad round. And I think the shaft, the shaft on it is very rusty. I think that might have been Ooh. why. I've got I've um, replaced it. But yeah, yes putters, a lot of tech and if you know, you probably get them for a very good price. I just want to follow up on Neil's point about um the the second hand retailers. I think they're a great option because of the amount of choice they offer you. You versus new, you're getting so much more choice in every different category. And also just the ability if you go to one of these shops, it's not just golf clubs for cash. You've got replay golf, there's a few around there where you can actually go in and and physically see and touch the product. That's like one of the main benefits of having these sorts of shops. If you're buying a club online, you know, there might be some pretty sketchy pictures. You can't really see the condition of the club or what it looks like. But I think, you know, as long as it's just superficial and cosmetic, it shouldn't make too much difference to the performance. Obviously, if there's like subtle cracks on the face or in the shaft, that's something you need to be really wary of. But if it's just cosmetic, the chances are you're going to be get, getting on with it just fine. It's not going to have an impact on the performance. You are, but I'll just add that anything that looks really, really well loved perhaps you might want to upgrade that club sooner <laughs> but that's the yeah. whole point about secondhand clubs isn't it if you want to go down the second hand route you know there's half a chance that whatever you buy it is it obviously it's going to look and feel a bit older sooner and so you might want to upgrade a bit a bit sooner but that's kind of the that's all the, the compromise that's the compromise that you're trying to make isn't it yeah if you, you save money on second hand it, it leaves you on money to either spend in other areas like a new pair of shoes or balls or whatever also or you save money to better buy the new driver that comes out in two or three years time so that, that's the advantage of, of going second hand it's almost like that stop gap between either buying some other stuff or buying a new a new product later on and it's the same research wise, Neil. It's the same as you said to buying a new one. You'll Google reviews, you'll read the reviews on the Golf Monthly website. We've got them going back as far as I can remember golf clubs existing. Um, you do your research, you sort of narrow down with your spec and models you like to ones you want to take a look at and see what's out there and have a nice little browse. And there's nothing quite like finding a deal, I think. Yeah. No. So, and you can we do that with second hand clubs. We all have a deal, right? And you can do that with second hand clubs because there's slightly more vari- variation in prices. Um, I've got one of my favourite old clubs here. Before we move on to some more advice, I'm trying to whack anything with it. Taylor made Rocket Ball. Do you remember when these came oh, out? I remember um, this is my when they first came out, rusty Dan. hybrid, state of the top line there. See, I roofed a few there. Look at that. Um, that, that is an estate. My dad a bought this, Yeah, my dad bought this to me when I was. Oh, that's not going to help. My dad <laughs> bought this to me when I was twelve, I think. Um, and I've had I had it in the bag up until maybe last year, and it was just fantastic huge problem with these clubs though and it went with the with the white smoke putters that i think came out at a similar time that white finish was just awful i don't think if what did you think when you guys reviewed that initially because they age terribly that's why i would i would as much as i love this club and rocket balls and even like r11 and clubs like that that white finish did no favors for longevity i think if you pick one up now it's gonna have sky marks in it really isn't it good for alignment but uh, yeah, not so good for a longevity. You're right. I think everyone I've seen who's used a club like that, those chips appear pretty quickly all yeah. over the face. And it, it can be annoying. You know, when you buy a club, you want it to look as pristine for as long as possible. And you're not going to get that with those sorts of clubs with the white finish. And I did upgrade the grip. And this is something you can do with a secondhand club. And do you just not love the work I've done there with the green golf pie grip mm. into the green nice. shaft? I think that's, yeah, I really love this club. That's, so uh, do you know, actually, that's quite safe. But the, the, the all the clubs that I tested when I was at, when I did my golf clubs for cash trip, 
the ones with new grips really that makes the world a difference having a fresh grip on there can make an older club give it a new lease of life exactly um, what i did with this exactly what i did with it. and it's something nice. you can do even if you pick one up that's got a bit of a naff grip on it just 10 quid for a new grip and and yeah new lease of life feels like a new club 100%. Um, and one last one i also found tailor-made rossa monza spider itsy bitsy putter found one left-handed on golf clubs of cash website with the original grip part of me thinks that's the one i had when i was a kid that somehow <laughs> gone through you know three or four other people and back online um but it was 99 pounds which shows to me some clubs hit a certain point where they become either rare or so well loved that they then go back up in price because you one would feel like that should be a lot it's less that's an old putter simple case of economics isn't it supply yeah. and demand you know if the demand is there for a product then it will retain its value longer um but that, you know that's what the, that's the it's market cool. that you're in love for it. something like this yeah and you know left-handed 33 inch putter from 10 15 years ago they're going to be a bit more expensive i think but yeah love that club as well um nice trip down memory lane there um so some clubs you think you should look out for and a little bit of advice there for secondhand clubs should we go slightly more deep into the tips and tricks for going into the secondhand market and I want to start with irons because we've spoken a lot about um, good drivers to pick up and, and that that's fairly easy, providing you know what loft you need and what flex shaft you need. That's a fairly easy space. I think irons are a lot harder for people to go in the secondhand market with. I would often, if, if you're a beginner uh, or just looking for a new set of irons, I would point people into new irons over used ones. And that isn't very great for a secondhand episode special, but... There's just it's more of a minefield, I think. Um, the importance of having iron specs fit your exact uh, specs are really important. So lie, uh, lofts, uh, length of shaft, flex of shaft, and that can be a lot harder to find rather than just spending that bit extra money getting a fit for a new set. Um, so and, and the and irons are just a bit more battered than than drivers. So I don't know if you chaps, Joel, do you agree with that or do you think? It can be easy enough to go into the second hand market for irons. No, you're absolutely right, Dan. Loads more variables to think about. You've already covered them there, kind of the length, the lie, um, the lofts. Also, you know, don't forget these are the clubs that people are hitting into the ground, so they're going to get damaged a bit more quickly. They don't have head covers on, so they're going to get a bit more superficial damage on them sooner. So chips and dinks and things like that. But all I would say is just try and find um, a, a set in good condition where the the stand the quality of the heads is relatively consistent because a lot of golfers will practice with a seven iron, for example, on the range. So that will tend to wear out more than the other irons in the set. So if you can find a set that's relatively even in terms of the amount of wear they've got in your spec um, that matches as, as best as you can, that's probably the, the, the only advice we can give, really. Yeah. And I'm sure yeah, if, if I sold my irons now, the four iron would be in great, Nick, the eight <laughs> iron and wedge rubbish. Um, Neil, that's not great from us, is it? We, we were a secondhand special don't buy secondhand irons. There's got to be some advice for people out there who do want to go and buy a set of secondhand irons. What would you suggest? Well, I'm just going to contradict both of you slightly. Good. Um, no, we need that. Say, well, I'm just going to say, why are you buying secondhand clubs in the first place? You're buying secondhand clubs because you're wanting to save some money. So the biggest saving that you can make is with the biggest portion of the bag. So if you're buying a secondhand set of irons, it stands to reason that that's probably the area that you'll save the most money on. Um, I bought from eBay a, few, a couple of years ago, a second hand set of the Zuno Tezoid irons. And these irons had were, they really were battered. You, and whoever had them before me was obviously a very good golfer because the sweet spot on Ooh. all of the irons had just had, like had been seriously inundated over the years. But they were still a beautiful set of golf clubs, even though they, they were pretty well battered. They, they still looked, fantastic i would have been proud to put those in my golf bag um even though they they were pretty well battered so i just i just think possibly what i would say is that irons instead of saying i wouldn't say steer clear of irons i would say if you're wanting iron second hand you'll need to that needs to be reflected in the amount of research you do so you, yeah. you, you'll need to do that bit more research and factor in condition if you feel like condition is the condition of the clubs is going to be a major factor for you and for some people they're just looking for a cheap set of golf clubs or cheaper set of golf clubs to get them up and running so the, the condition of them is less important if condition is going to be a really important factor that in and then take some time to look over specs find out what, what the products are supposed to do that that set of cobra forged tech irons let me just get the price of those they came in at three two nine 
for five to pitching wedge. That's really good. There's a good set of irons. That's really so good. I think there are bargains to be had when it yeah. comes to irons. Um, but I just think you just need to do a bit more work, maybe to find. Yeah, them. it's definitely is, isn't it? Uh, and I think do uh, on on understanding your spec. You've spoken a lot about that, and you briefly uh, touched on it, Neil. There's plenty of research you can do on on swing speeds. I would I would go as far as recommending paying a PGA Pro or a fitter just to have. If if you don't want to buy new, you know you're going to go go and buy second hand. Go and get fitted as if you're getting fit for new clubs, and they'll say right. If you were buying new, you'd be half an inch longer, two degrees upright, um, and you want to go in this sort of iron head space, whether it be cavity back or, or player's distance or something. Go away with that information, and that helps your research going, right? So you've got some more specifics to dive into there. And you go onto these websites, Golf Clubs of Cash, Golf Bidder, eBay, and you'll know if one... You might not get that exact spec, especially if you're a bit niche, like I said, half an inch up or, or, or something like that. But if you you're going to go in the right area. You're not going to get something that's flat and half an inch short, for example. So that that can be a way I think people can really look into their research. Like you said, it, it needs a lot. Um, wedges. Would you ever go secondhand on wedges? Because this, again, is a is a club where you need those grooves nice and fresh. Um, they'll get battered around in bunkers in all parts of the golf course. Joel, was there any tips for looking at secondhand wedges? Because, again, this is something that people are going to want, want to be looking for. Um, I think as long as you're realistic about your expectations in terms of how much spin you're going to be able to generate um, with a used wedge, you know, you're, you're not going to get, it's unlikely you'll get wedges that are going to kind of take two hops and stand to attention um, when you're chipping and pitching. But as long as you kind of manage that in your head and, and try and find a model that's that's suitable for you, obviously you do have a lot of options in the wedge section as well in terms of grinds and lofts and things like that. So make sure you know what lofts you want and try and pick the ones where, the club base is in, in as good a condition as possible. Look at pictures, look at the quality of the grooves. Have they degraded you know, significantly or are they do they still look in relatively good condition? Um, because the grooves is the area of the face where you're going to get the, the spin and that's going to give you the control and the consistency and the predictability. So, um, yeah, wedges, it's a tough one. You know, you can probably get some good ones out there, but you are going to sacrifice a little bit of control, I think, versus new. Definitely. Um, and last one on this then for, for advice to people buying secondhand clubs at the minute, Neil. Um, eBay and Facebook Marketplace. There's there's slightly more of a minefield. It's probably slightly more, you know, with the guys at Golf Clubs of Cash, Golf Bidder, all of these slightly more reputable places. They're sort of checking these clubs, advertising them as seen. You can trust them. But that's not to say that eBay and Facebook Marketplace aren't really good places to go and pick up a good deal as well. Again, providing you do your research, right? Absolutely. I bought a a driver from Facebook Marketplace. John and I did a, a had a challenge a couple of years ago. Did we? What was the Was it ten pounds? We had to pick up a driver for ten quid. <laughs> yeah, <All> right. yeah, <laughs> brilliant. But we were we still got it. The boat out on, on the budget, did we? <laughs> I bought and I bought a very old square um, driver, and <laughs> you know it, it, it's worth a look. It's worth a look. And if you know what you're doing, then if you know what you're looking for, I remember also that, that, that there have been, particularly in the putters um, sector, there are products that are used on tour currently that are seriously old, <laughs> that have been around for years and years and years. Oh, yeah. and someone's found an old trusty and they've had it in the bag for ages. Sometimes you can find these, put these, these products that are used on tour that are available for like an absolute snip so yeah that, yeah that there's so what golf clubs for cash do um and, and the other retailers that you've spoken of is vetting the stuff that comes in exactly grading yeah. them for the condition that grading, they're in and then having an idea about where that sits on a sort of price spectrum um with ebay and facebook marketplace that's where the kind of market decides there's where, where you know that old, that old adage that something is only worth what someone is willing to pay for it that's the sort of mindset around around those places that's but you know if you if you are after something very specific often you will be able to find that on those on those sites so it's worth yeah. it's worth a look absolutely plenty of places to, to look at there and last one there you mentioned what tour players are using the likes of justin rose and richard bland with the m2 driver or fairway something in their bag again if you're looking for, trying to do research on what clubs are good still what tour players have got some niche clubs in the bags i mean they like it. It's obviously a decent club, right? So uh, another way to go about it there. And, and hopefully some good advice uh, there for people looking 
um, to buy second hand, some clubs to look out for, some franchises, as well as some pitfalls to avoid and, and your keys, getting your research done, picking some products you like and, and going from there. Go find yourself a deal. Um, but that pretty much wraps up this episode, chaps. And the last gear of the week for the year. It's been a good year. Um, we've got a very, very busy time on the Golf Monthly YouTube channel uh, between now and New Year, so the next 15 days or so leading up to Christmas and that little period between Christmas and New Year. Um, well, there's not much to do apart from watch good YouTube videos. So we've got a lot coming out. Um, before I sign off today, I'm going to ask you what uh, what you both have, are most excited about on the Golf Monthly YouTube channel before 2022 is out. We've got some good videos coming up. Neil, what's, what are you most excited about well, we uh, on recently, our YouTube channel? We recently had... Um... We spent a morning with Rick Shields actually creating uh, a load of content for the magazine and for our YouTube channel, um, including a big interview where we talked to Rick about his sort of plans for the future, what he, he wants to do, and actually some really interesting insights into where what direction he thinks golf is heading in and should head in. That's look, worth looking out for. But the actual video I'm gonna uh, I'm going to trail here is a 30 minute range session. So the, the whole idea was how to make practice fun, how to get something uh, out of it. So we set Rick a target of doing something within that 30 minutes that had a structure to it, but was also fun. Uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, I haven't seen That's the edit of good. the video. It's not been done yet, but I saw the video as it was being made and it was very good. Well, yeah, I heard you guys went up there to meet him and I'm really excited to watch that, uh, especially that interview. I think that sounds really, really interesting. So yeah, Rick Shields on the channel. Very exciting. Joel, what are you looking forward to? So my video would be best portable launch monitors under six hundred dollars. Yes. So this, this was, was a, um, this was a fun test we did. So we had five different launch monitors, kind of all going at the same time. So we sent you out on the range. I'm sure you I remember. I was getting balls hit at me. Yeah, uh, as I was you hitting do. balls at you. Health and safety was out was, the window. Was out the window. Um, we, I was lasering where the ball was finishing, so I knew exactly how far the shot was actually hit. And then we were looking at all five different launch monitors and seeing which one was the most accurate. Also considering other things like practicality and ease of use and things like yeah. that. But I think this is a really good video if you're interested in um, upgrading or buying into a new portable launch monitor, understanding which one's going to give you kind of best value for money, most amount of features, which one's the most accurate. Uh, watch this video. It's coming really soon and uh, you should really enjoy it. Yeah, I loved filming that one. Um, and it's always something I wanted to do with portable launch monitors, get them all together, reading the same ball and seeing which is most accurate. So very excited for that. I'm going to trail our video, Joel, where we build the ultimate bag of 2022. So sort of a reflection on all the clubs that got released in 2022. I may have snuck a couple in from 21. Um, and we sort of <laughs> built our ultimate bag, you know, regardless of price and what's performed really well for us this year. Um, so look forward to that. As well, very busy time in the Golf Month, the YouTube channel. So make sure you're subscribing to the channel. And if you hit that little bell notification icon thing, you will get notified when these videos do get released. Uh, but that will do for Gear of the Week for 2022. We'll be back uh, in this format on January the 1st with a, a reflection of 2022 and a small look ahead to 2023. Uh, but for now, Neil, thank you very much for joining Thanks, us. Um, uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, all that sort enjoy of Enjoy your reading up over the festive period. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> thank you i'm uh, really excited festival for me oh, joel send me that ping encyclopedia yeah i need to do some work over christmas i will i'm gonna go and dry my tears for getting that yes. question wrong uh yeah gutted uh good stuff chaps thank you for joining us uh, and thank you very much for watching hope you've enjoying the gear of the week show uh we'll see you in 2023 enjoy the rest of the videos coming out on the golf month youtube channel and we'll see you very soon